just this morning, uh, I was having a conversation with someone, and, and I said, you know, life feels like you're carrying this two and a half pound weight perpendicular to your body sometimes. It's not very heavy at first, but the longer you hold it, the heavier and heavier and heavier it gets, and it just feels like at some points I can't hold it any longer. It's just weight is overwhelming. And this person looked at me and said, yep, yeah, but I feel like I'm carrying 10-pound weights in both hands. And I think if we were honest, some of us came into church this morning, and we feel like we're carrying a huge weight on our shoulders. And, and it's a weight that we've been carrying for a long time. And I, honestly, we're not even sure how we get out of bed each morning and take another step. Because this weight, we go to bed at night, and there it is. And we wake up the next morning, and there it is. And every day is a struggle. So here's what I'd like to do before we pray and get into the message. Um, we, don't, we don't need to know what, what your thing is. But if, if you're in here this morning and you're just saying, listen, I'm struggling. I'm carrying that weight. Do me a favor, raise your hand. Do me a favor and just raise your hand. You're that person. You're just carrying some kind of weight. Okay, thank you so much. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to pray for you real quick. Um, I I think we we, we just carry these deep struggles. And let me just pray for you before we get started. Heavenly Father, God, there were people all across this room who just admit that they are struggling. They are carrying some weight and carrying some burdens that... Maybe nobody else even knows about. Maybe nobody else has even heard about their struggles and they feel all alone in their struggles. God, I pray that you will love them, will care for them, will walk beside them, will encourage them, bring somebody into their life who can help lift their spirits, who can lift their soul. Let them feel encouraged. Give them hope in the midst of what maybe seems like a hopeless situation. God, I pray that as we dive into your word this morning, I pray that you teach us something profound. I pray that you teach us something that changes our lives and helps us deal with all of this loss and hurt and pain. Help me, Lord. Help me to clearly communicate your word. I love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, as you can tell, it's kind of the Chris show today. It is not normally like this. Like, yeah, I'm not normally up here this much. Like, they're like, it's all you, buddy. I'm like, that sounds great. Okay. (laughs) Okay, so my one instruction was uh, don't burn the house down. So, what they don't know won't hurt them. No, I'm just teasing. There will be no burning of the house down. Um, I was going to have fireworks in the background, but we're not going to do that. So, on top of it being the Chris show, which is a little uncomfortable for me, on top of being the Chris show, I also get to introduce a brand new series. So it's like, hey, here's some responsibility. You can handle it, right? You pay my bills. Yes, I can. And so, um, so <laughs> I am going to be introducing a brand new series today. And this series is going to take us all the way up until Thanksgiving. We're going to be studying the book of James And really, we're going to be studying faith that works. Like, how does our faith get lived out? That's what we're going to be studying for the next few weeks. And so I'm preaching this week, and I'm preaching next week. And then it'll be back to normal routine. George and Tim will be doing some messages and stuff like that. But I'll be here for the next two weeks. So, introducing a brand new series. Let me start it off by this. We need to understand James just a little bit, and let me introduce James to you. Um, we all have different kinds of friends. I mean, all of us have all sorts of different kinds of friends. Well, I, I mean, I hope you have a lot of friends, and we all have different kinds of friends. And one of those types of friends is the friend that, like, they're the ever encourager. I mean, they're just like a walking motivational poster. Like, and you go up to them with ideas, and you have these big dreams, and you're like, hey, I'm thinking about doing this, and they like pull a Nike check sticker out of their pocket and put it on your shirt. You can do it. And so they're that person. Their coffee cup has motivational posters on it. I mean, they are just like 
one big walking ball of happiness. And you look at them and you're like, <laughs> I can never be you, but I'm glad to have you in my life. And so you have that kind of friend. And you go to that type of friend when you really need a pick-me-up. I mean, anybody ever need a pick-me-up? Yeah? Ever? Okay, no. Okay, everybody's like, no, I'm always happy. Well, I need those type friends who just kind of like the ever-encourager. And you go to that person with a big dream, and they're just going to pat you on the back. You can do it, buddy. You're awesome. And then you have the other type of friend. Now, this is the type of friend that if you need an honest answer, you need the truth, you go to them. And so you go up to your friend, and you're like, hey, listen, I was thinking about pursuing a career in Broadway. And the friend looks at you and is like, dude, you can't clap and sing at the same time. You shouldn't be on Broadway. And so you're like, I can too. And so <laughs> that, friend, that friend is straight forward. They tell you how it is. And so you walk away like with two kind of feelings. You walk away kind of miserable because they were so straightforward, but then you also, in the end, appreciate it because you aren't on a blooper reel of American Idol. And so, like, they're, they're a good friend, but they are really, really, really straightforward and really honest, and they don't mince words, and sometimes you wish they mince words, but they don't. Well, James is the second friend. Like, he's not going to come up to you and be like, you can do it, buddy. You're going to walk away feeling like, Okay, that's great. Awesome. Thanks for that. He is so straightforward. Sometimes he's so straightforward that it kind of feels like, like he slapped you in the face, then gave you a hug at the same time, and so you don't really know how to feel about all of it, and that's okay. That's okay. In the end, James is going to be unbelievably helpful to us in figuring out how faith works. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and take it and turn to James chapter 1. We're going to be going through the first 18 verses, hopefully, in uh, today's message. And so here's what James chapter 1, verse 1 says. It says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. Now, amazingly, the author of James is... James, <laughs> it's sad that you said that so unconfident-like. It's right up there. Yes, James wrote the book of James. Now, let me tell you a little bit about James, because maybe you, you don't really know James. So let me tell you a little bit about him. James was called James the Just. James the Just. He was this devout follower of Jesus Christ. He was this committed follower of Jesus Christ, and we have records of him all the way dating back, like outside of the Bible, we have records of him dating back very, very recently after his death. And we, we know from those records that James was one of the most committed, dedicated, loyal followers of Jesus Christ, and he helped start the very first church that ever got started after Jesus. Like he was one of the like pastors at the very first church that got started after Jesus. And James was this unbelievably devout follower. And, and here's a quote from a historian. His name is Eusebius. Don't name your kid that. But um, that was that, that's his name. And Eusebius says this. says, James used to enter alone into the temple and be found kneeling and praying for forgiveness for the people so that his knees grew hard like a camel's because of his constant worship of God. Kneeling and asking for forgiveness for the people. So from his excessive righteousness, he was called the just. See, he would spend hours pleading to the Lord, please forgive them, please forgive them, Lord, please forgive them. I mean, he'd spend so long praying that his knees would get calloused. I mean, he was this committed follower of Jesus. But what you might not know was that James was the brother of Jesus. Now, can I ask you a quick question? Okay, just think about this in your brain. What would it take you for your brother to convince you he was the savior of the world? <laughs> Some of you are like, <laughs> not mine. And so, like, I have a brother 
There's no way he can convince me that he is the savior of the world. Like, it's not happening. I mean, he could do some cool magic card tricks, but he's still not convincing me, savior of the world. But James literally believed his brother was the Lord God, the savior of the whole world. And then he writes this book, this letter to other people, telling them what is the right way to live for Jesus. Oh my goodness. You see, the only thing that would convince James that Jesus was the savior of the world is if Jesus could predict his own death and resurrection and then pull it off. And he did. But see, James, he saw the empty tomb. And he had a meal with his brother after he came back to life. Along with 500 other witnesses who saw Jesus. And so when we read the book of James... We've kind of missed something over the years. We've said something along the the effect of the Bible says, but listen, it's so much better than the Bible says. James, the brother of Jesus, says. Like, man, if you're not a Christian, you're not a Christ follower. I mean, this is one of the greatest evidence for the faith. That the brother of Jesus would be so absolutely convinced that Jesus is the savior of the world. That he would tell everybody else, here's how to live for him. Here's what the church should look like. And here's how your life should function. So when we're stepping into this, I need you to remember in the back of your mind, this is Jesus' brother talking. It's beautiful. So we got a lot of work to do. We got a lot of verses to go through. And so we're going to start in James chapter 1, verse 2. James 1, verse 2. It says this: Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Can we just be completely honest? And I know it's church, so it's a little bit hard to do that, but can we be completely honest? Sometimes life really stinks. I mean, really stinks. Anybody? Has life ever stunk for you? Raise your hand if life has ever stunk for you. Okay, some of you are like, always good, been always good. Give it time, it'll stink. I mean, sometimes life just stinks. It just does. It's just the reality of it. Sometimes it's just not fun. I mean, work isn't fun. Our relationships aren't fun. Marriage might not be fun. Like, things just happen. People get sick. Life really stinks sometimes. And death happens unexpectedly and it stinks and and can i be honest with you just when when my life stinks the last thing i want somebody to do is to come up to me and be like hey consider it pure joy Mm -hmm. yeah okay like like in eighth grade i watched my grandfather flatline on the hospital bed like i watched him die in front of my eyes And, like, I didn't want my pastor to come up to me and be like, hey, buddy, I know your granddad died. Consider it pure joy. Like, I didn't didn't want that. I didn't want that. And so let's do some little bit of work and define what joy means in the face of life stinking. If you have your notes, um, this is a good note to take. Here's what joy means. Joy means resilient faith. That God will get me through what I'm going through. Joy means resilient faith that God will get me through what I'm going through. See, what's at stake during times of trial isn't your happiness, it's your faith. What's at stake, let me say that again, what's at stake during times of life being horrible is not your happiness, it's your faith. See, God isn't looking for you to go walk around being this fake, happy, smile Christian. Life is awesome. Like, God's not looking for you to go around and be like, oh, hey, you tore your ACL this week. It's okay. God's got this. Yay. Like, he's not, which is what we do sometimes. Like, we drive to church, and our kids are horrible demon child that we don't know who raised them. And we drive to church, and we're doing the swat in the back seat. Like, you shut up. And then we get out of the car, and hello, all church folks. Hello. 
so good to see you. Life is perfect. My kids are great. Shut up, I'll beat you. You know, that's kind of how we, that's, I mean, that's the truth. It's <laughs> never happened in my car. My car is the perfect spotless car. And so, but um, God's not looking, God's not looking for us just to put this fake pretend smile on. Because what's at stake isn't our happiness. What's at stake is our faith. See, consider it pure joy. I know that God's going to get me through what I'm going through. I, I trust that he's going to get me through this. I don't know how. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know how it's going to work out. But I trust that God is going to get me through what I'm going through. I know it's going to happen. Let's keep reading. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may mat be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Can I teach you a principle that I would like to tell you I believe all the time, but there are moments where I just don't? But that makes the principle... That doesn't change how true the principle is. This principle is true. And, and here's what it is. Here's what it is. And we learn this from this verse. When nothing is working, God is at work. When nothing is working, God is at work. When you look at your life and you just can't explain it all. You don't understand why things are happening the way they're happening. You don't understand why you hurt the way you hurt. You don't understand why the situation came up. You just don't get it. I'm just telling you, when nothing is working behind the scenes, God is at work. And, and so many of you know this because you can look back over your life and you can see that in your darkest of moments, God was planning something in your life that you didn't see coming. When I was 16 years old, I felt this call by God. I know that sounds a little bit weird, but I felt this call by God that um, I was going to go into full-time ministry. So I've never been one of those kids who like, I don't know what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. From that moment, I knew what I wanted to do, and this is what I felt God calling me to do. And so from the age of 16, I continued on this path where I went to Bible college and graduated with a degree and um, but in that meantime, I was attending another church. I was 21 years old. And I loved this other church. And in fact, I still love this other church. Some of my closest friends go to this other church. It's a church in the area. And when I was 21 years old, I was living down in Sebring, Avon Park area, just kind of go south of Lake Wales about 20 minutes. And I was living down there, and we were driving all the way up to Winter Haven every Sunday and then once a week for a small group. Like, we were committed to this church. We love this church. And the pastor calls me up um, one, one day during the week, and he asks if he can meet with me. And so um, we, we meet, and he interviews me to become the youth pastor at that church. At, at 21, he interviews me to become the youth pastor there. And I'm just telling you, my eyes lit up, my heart exploded with joy, I just thought, here it is, finally, five years in the making, like 16 years old, God said, this is what you're going to do, 21, here it is, here's my opportunity, God has finally opened up a door, and so we interviewed, and I thought it went amazing, like I thought it went so well that my wife and I started to look at apartments up here so that we could move into, and we had already kind of picked where we were going to move to. I don't know if you've ever been in this moment, but we picked where we were going to live at, and we were so overwhelmed. We'd just kind of gotten married, and we were so excited about what the future held, and God's got all these huge possibilities. And him and I met again, and man, I thought it went so good again. I was like, man, this is perfect. This is absolutely perfect. This is where God has me be. I love this church. I love this pastor. This is the youth group that I'm supposed to lead. I am so excited. And one day he calls me. 
and he says, man, we've had some really good interviews, but I'm just letting you know we're not going to go with you. And it, as a 30-year-old, okay, I'm, I'm okay with that now. When, it, when I was 21, I'm telling you, all my dreams and hopes and aspirations crumbled at the time. At the time, I was delivering pizzas for a living. Woohoo! Pizzas for Jesus! Like that, like, like I, I was, <laughs> that was not in my notes, by the way. And so, like, <laughs> so I, I was so crushed. Like, even thinking about it right now. Man, I, I was so heartbroken. Our family was heartbroken. And we just sat there, we just sat there as a family thinking, God, what are you doing? Everything looked perfect here. What are you doing? What are you doing? And I bet you've either gone through one of those moments or you're going through one of those moments where you look at God and you just think, what are you doing? What are you doing? My dad wasn't supposed to get sick. My kids weren't supposed to do that. I wasn't supposed to lose my job. We weren't supposed to be in this much financial trouble at our age. Like, we weren't supposed to have this happen. What are you doing, God? What are you doing? And listen, I, I don't know why all, it's hap all that's happening in your life. I, I, I don't know why your husband got cancer. I don't know why your spouse left you. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know all the reasons. I don't know the reasons why you struggle, why you struggle. I, I, don't, I can't sit here and tell you, man, you're not really struggling. It's not that big a deal because you really are at your core. But here's what I can tell you. In the midst of your struggle, in the midst of your struggle, when it seems like nothing is working, God is at work. God is at work. And see, we combine joy, the resilient faith that God will get me through what I'm going through, with this principle, when nothing is working, I know God is at work, we can find joy. Because we know, and we're going to hold on to the fact that God is doing something, even if I don't see it right now. Even if I don't see it Right. Now, let's keep reading. It says in verse 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. And that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord, such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Um, if you do have your own Bible, um, I, I would underline, highlight, circle, do whatever you have to, that word wisdom. Because I want you to notice something. In the midst of your struggles, in the midst of what you're going through, um, James says, have joy, God is doing something. And then he says, pray, but you notice what he doesn't say pray for? He doesn't say pray for a resolution. He, he doesn't say, hey, pray that your whole situation will go away and get fixed. He doesn't say that. Be because sometimes the situation doesn't get fixed, and that's the hard truth. And in fact, the reason why you might have walked away from the faith is because you prayed that God would fix a problem, and he didn't, and you got mad at God, so you left the church, and you left the faith. And James is saying, whoa, 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 whoa. Let, let's adjust your prayer life a little bit. Let's adjust the way you talk to God. Instead of asking for a resolution, which is fine to ask for that, but instead of asking for a resolution, what if we first ask for wisdom? See, most of our prayer lives, and I fall right into this category, 
most of our prayer lives are so simplistic. They are so simplistic. They fall under three phrases. I mean, if you just kind of can think about your prayer life, even, you know, maybe this week or this morning, it kind of falls under three different phrases or three different categories. And here's the three phrases. Lord, bless me. Lord, bless me. Bless this person. Bless me. Bless this person. There's a lot of sneezing going around. Lord, bless me. Bless this person. Bless me. Lord, heal me. Heal me. Heal this person. Fix them. Make them better. Take the illness away. Bless me. Heal me. Bless me. Heal me. Keep me safe. Bless me. Heal me. Keep me safe. Bless me. Heal me. Keep me safe. I mean, that's your prayers. Bless me, heal me, keep me safe. Bless me, heal me, keep me safe. I mean, you could just have those words on repeat, and that's your prayer life. Lord, bless my family. Lord, heal our uncle who's sick. Keep us safe as we travel today. Boom, that's our, that's our prayers. And there's nothing inherently wrong with those prayers. Those prayers are okay. Those prayers are fine. But if that is the sum and substance total of your prayer, your prayer life is missing something huge. Because bless me, heal me, keep me safe is not the prayers we need to be praying in the midst of our darkest hours. What if our prayers look something like this? God, I know when everything seems out of control, and right now it does, you are in control. God, give me the wisdom to know how to handle this situation. Help me to see my current circumstances through your perspective. Lord, I need your wisdom, and I need your perspective. Whew. That connects you with the Heavenly Father in such a deep and personal and intimate way. Instead of, bless me, heal me, keep me safe, bless me, heal me, keep me safe. What if we said, Lord, God... I don't know why I'm going through this. I know you didn't make this happen, but God, I don't know why this is happening, but I trust that you are in control. I trust that you are working through this situation. God, give me wisdom to know how to handle this. So many of us treat God as if he is a genie with a magic wand waiting just to bless you, heal you, keep you safe. Bless you, heal you, keep you safe. When he is so much more. He is this heavenly father who wants to wrap his loving arms around you in the midst of your hurt and pain and worries and anxiety. He is the friend that walks alongside of you in the midst of your journey. He is so much more than this just genie who waves a magic wand and fixes all of our problems. So what if our prayer life started to look a little bit different? What if your prayer life looked a little bit different? Instead of bless me, heal me, keep me safe. And those aren't bad prayers. I'm not saying stop praying those. But instead of just those prayers, what if you say, God, help me see this perspective the way you see this perspective. God, give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. Keep reading. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their, their high position. But the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. It blossoms fall and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Some of you have so much money, you don't even know what to do with all of it. Now, on the other side, some of you have so little money, you know exactly what you would do with it. You would pay your bills, you would, I mean, like, you know exactly what you would do if you had money. And, and I think the point of this passage is, is not particularly about money, but here is the point. Your situation is temporary. And maybe you've never thought about this. Whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you're sick or you're healthy, whether life is great or life stinks, 
it is all temporary. There is going to come a day when all of us, the statistics prove it, it's 10 out of 10, we're all going to die. Like, you can't break that statistic. It's going to happen. And we then can begin to look at our situation in light of eternity, not in light of our temporary circumstances and moments that we're dealing with. Because all of the accolades you get at work, all the money you bring home, all the house sizes that you have or houses that you have, all the cars that you own, all of that is temporary. All of it is temporary. The current circumstance that you find yourself in is temporary. But you need to ask yourself the question, and maybe you've never took time to think about it. What's on the other side of temporary? On the other side of temporary is eternity. So in, in our circumstances, if we can pray for wisdom, we can see that this moment we're dealing with is temporary and God is doing something for all of eternity with our lives. Keep reading. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Let me warn you. And maybe you know this, but maybe you don't. Let me just warn you, please, and, and if you've just kind of tuned out all up to this point, and you've kind of been in, sleeping well, congratulations, it's time to wake up. And so, um, because this is very, very big. Your darkest moment is fertile ground for you to make your biggest mistake. Your darkest moment is fertile ground for you to make the biggest mistake. You see, listen, listen. When your marriage is going great, it's so easy to love our spouse and to only think about our spouse and only care about our spouse. But when friction and tension is at home, but that same friction and tension isn't there with our coworker. We can so easily, in the darkest moments of our marriage, flee the arms of our spouse and run into the arms of another. You've seen it happen. See, in your darkest moment, your darkest moment, it is fertile ground for your deepest mistake and regret. And you need to be careful you need to be careful because there are these warning signs popping up all over the place. And your darkest moment is the moment when you are tempted to walk away from the faith so easily. Because you begin to kind of have these questions swirl around in your brain of how could you, God? What were you thinking, God? I can't believe you did, God. And those questions are not a very long leap to, I don't believe in you, God. You don't matter to me anymore, and you're not a part of my life anymore. I'm on my own. See, your darkest moments, your darkest moments is fertile ground for your biggest mistake. See, another way you've seen this work, and, and, Listen, if you have a kid that's going off to college, this is a good conversation you should have with them. Um, freshman goes off to college, or freshman in college, they move away, and they go off, and they've left all of their friends that they had in high school, and they've left mom and dad, and the reality is, that first week, it's a time of loneliness and awkwardness. It just is. And in the midst of that loneliness, it is easier to have bad friends and not be lonely than it is to stay faithful 
and to deal and handle the loneliness. Because when that loneliness sinks in, I mean, you know, when that loneliness sinks in, it is fertile ground for you to make some of your deepest regrets. And probably some of your biggest regrets come back from high school and college and young adulthood. When inside you were so lonely, but you were willing to go to anybody who would just love you for a moment. Because I'm telling you, in your darkest moment, it is fertile ground for you to make your deepest mistakes and regrets. You need to be on guard. Like if your marriage is struggling, don't struggle in silence. Go see a counselor. Go get help. Bring other friends into your life. Get to work. Because if you don't get to work, if you don't begin to pursue a solution, then you're going to end up at a place where your marriage falls apart and you've found somebody else. But then here's what's going to happen five years down the road. The next person that you found to find you know, love and friendship with, five years down the road, the same thing's going to happen with them. And you're friendship which was so perfect early on is going to begin to drift and now your second marriage you're leaving that one to go to the third marriage i mean this is why if you've ever looked at the divorce rates the divorce rates exponentially increase the more you, you've been divorced so like it it's like 40 percent 60 percent 70 percent and the divorce rates just go higher and higher and higher after every marriage because Your darkest moments are fertile ground for you to make your biggest mistakes. So here's what I need you to hear. Your greatest life, your greatest life is found when you pursue Jesus above all else, even when life stinks. When you pursue a godly marriage, even when marriage stinks, when you pursue godly finances, even when it just seems so difficult and it just seems so hard and it would just be so easy to waste your money and to spend money all these other places, when you choose to live the way that Jesus has called us to live, you will find your best life. Now hear me, I didn't say your easiest life. Because I don't want to give you some like sugar-coated Christianity that somebody might have lied to you when, they were, when you were younger. Where they told you, follow Jesus and life is easy because that is not the truth. But I'm telling you, your best life is found when you pursue Jesus above all else. See, your faith is what's at stake, not your happiness. So when you get into that moment, your dad gets sick brother gets sick relationships are crumbling you're not sure where the money's going to come from you're not sure how you can function another day you have an option you're at a fork in a road and the option is i can run away from god and his plan as far and as fast as i can or i can lean in heavily to my savior who loves me and will walk with me through this. See, in your deepest struggles is in the moments when your loving Heavenly Father is reaching down and loves you. He's there for you. I've told this story before, but it's been a couple of years, so I want to retell this story so when my daughter was two years old, I have a daughter and a son, and when my daughter was two years old, she, um, she loved to run and play, but she had this like super funky thing. She's kind of a girly girl, prissy to no end. She just is, dresses all the time. It's a pink explosion in her room. That's just kind of how she's wired. Um, we didn't force it upon her. She's just kind of wired that way. And so one of the things is like she's learning how to run, and she's doing great, but when you put her in grass, it was like she's run, and as soon as she steps in grass, it was like this. I mean, she's like looking around like, can't you see this is quicksand, not grass? Like, don't you see, Dad, I'm stuck, I can't move. I mean, she seriously, as soon as she would be in grass, she just wouldn't go anywhere. 
I, I, I didn't understand. I mean, my adult brain is like, you can still go. It's not that tall. I know daddy hasn't mowed in three weeks, but still, like, you can go. Like, you can still go. But no, 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 no. She, she was just stuck. She was stuck. And she would look for me. And she would look for me. And as soon as I reached my hand out to her, and she took hold of my hand, then she would begin to pull me along and she could run in the grass as if it wasn't even there. She could just have the greatest time as long as she was holding my hand. See, when you're in your darkest moment, your loving Heavenly Father is bending down and saying, here's my hand. Let's walk through this together. We can do this together. We can make it through. Let's keep reading. We're almost done. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. See, God has something beautiful and wonderful in store for your life, and maybe you haven't even seen it before, maybe you haven't even known it, but all of those good and perfect gifts that he has been throwing your way, even in the midst of tragedy, Loving Heavenly Father throwing a lifeline your way. See, I said it in the beginning. I'm going to say it again. When nothing is working, God is at work. When nothing is working, God is at work. So I didn't get that job at the church. I was 21 years old, didn't get the job at the church. Devastated, life is crushed. I just feel like, what are you doing, God? What is happening here. But when nothing was working, God was at work. Fast forward a little bit of time, the church hires another youth pastor. And for the next two years, I served right alongside that youth pastor. And that youth pastor now has become one of my greatest friends and mentors I could ever dreamed of having. See, I promise you this, any ministry that I do, whether youth or on stage, would never have happened if I didn't have that man come into my life and help lead me and make me into the leader that I am today. Like, he came into my life and helped shape and mold me in this beautiful and wonderful way. But he had my job. But I'm telling you, and he's spoken to our youth group before he is one of my closest, closest people. He's one of the people I go to all the time about life and worries and anxieties. See, when I lost the job and I didn't get it, I didn't know that God had something more beautiful in store for me. That God was working even when it seemed like nothing was at work. See, the shadow that is standing behind me as I'm doing ministry to students every single week, the shadow that is standing behind me is that guy's mentorship and leadership. He's the one that has helped guide and shape me in this beautiful and wonderful way. But if I just stayed mad at God, I would have never received that blessing that he had planned for me. I don't know why you're going through what you're going through. And you could come up to me and you could tell me the saddest, sobbest story and I would listen and I might even just weep with you and I would feel for you and I would just look at you and say, I, I, don't, I don't know why you're going through that. I don't understand. And I don't even know if it's going to get any better. But I can promise you that when nothing is working, nothing, God is at Heavenly Father, God, we love you so much. God, we 
we need you. We need you to walk beside us. We need you to lead us. We need you to We need you to help us. Extend your hand to us. Help us to know that you are there for us. Some of us haven't felt your presence for quite some time. Help us to feel and to know your presence. Lord, this week, God, I pray that we just trust that you are at work, even when we can't see it, even when we don't know what you're doing. God, we love you so very much. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for being here. I hope today was a blessing to you. As you leave today, don't forget your tithes and offerings and your communication card. We love you so much. Hopefully we'll see you back next week.